New England was the only region of the U.S. having public elementary schools in the year 1800. There was one schoolhouse for every two to four square miles, which is three to six square kilometers. Some schools were funded from local taxes, while others were funded through the barter system. For example, a family might bring a load of wood for the school to use, or they might bring a load of something that the teacher could trade. In the 1840s, Horace Mann argued that universal education would guarantee the nation's political and economic stability and that it was a public matter for the public's good and should not remain a luxury of the elite. He said it would prepare informed and intelligent citizens and that in a republic, ignorance is a crime. We must prepare children to become good citizens, develop their capacities, enrich their minds, and imbue their hearts with the love of truth and duty. We agree with this today. We consider education to be an important part of being human and believe that no one should be denied an education. With each new thing that you learn or accomplish, you become a fuller person, a more complete citizen, and are then able to contribute more to the operation and progress of our mutual society. Horace Mann said, be ashamed to die before you have won some battle for humanity. In 1820, the curriculum of the New England public school was planned to be more practical than the Greek and Latin schooling of past centuries. Parents believed the purpose of school was to teach children enough reading, writing, and arithmetic to enable them to add up a bill of purchase and to read and understand things like property deeds, the almanac's astrological recommendations, and especially the Bible. A particular reader and speller pair became popular because they also taught moral habits. Teachers soon added geography, history, and science. School attendance was not yet mandatory. Classes opened after harvest and closed before planting season began. Often, two and three-year-olds went along to school with their older siblings. Children were kept at home whenever they were needed for farm work. Most five to 15 year olds spent three to eight weeks per year in school. Since the western frontier had fewer schools, it often occurred that frontier children had the opportunity to learn to read and write only if their parents could teach them. Higher education was expanding in the east, but it was not meant for women and especially not meant for women to use in pursuing professions. About 75 percent of the population could read and write. Law forbid us slaves to become literate because slave owners knew to try to restrict minds, but still many of us learned to be carpenters, metalsmiths, tanners, harness makers, shoemakers, and fiddlers and such. House. So. Is where all the students would come to get their education starting around three or four and going until their late teens. Or early twenties. Early twenties in some cases, yes. Depending <coughs> if you did care. And some sort of disability or yeah, yeah something's wrong with you. There were no there were no attendance laws, so you didn't need to go for a set number of days. So there were two terms, one in the summer, one in the winter and you could pretty much come whenever you wanted. And there were no graduation requirements or any of that. In the winter, you had the full range of ages, three or four to late teens, early 20s, because uh, there wasn't as much to be done. But in the summer, it was mostly young kids under the age of 10, uh, because the older ones were at home helping out mom and dad on the farm. And they sent the young ones here to get them out of the way. So. You, the two terms were three months each, and you'd go Monday to Friday, half days on Saturdays. Um, it was around 9 to 4 with a one hour uh, dinner break and two 15 minute recesses. And other than that, you're sitting in your seat memorizing your lessons. There'd be ink in here, and you'd dip it in, and there's, it's hollow in here, so it would fill up, and then you can write down and practice your penmanship. So paper was very expensive at the time, about a cent for each sheet, and the average day labor only made 50 cents. So you didn't want all the kids to start on paper, so you used slate boards for the beginning. So as you can see, 
can see all of the ages would be here at once. So, not separated by classes or grades. Or, you are separated by gender. Girls are on one side, boys are on the other. And that extends even into recess. Gentlemen go out for recess first and ladies are next. It was mostly self-guided education. They would be reading the book and reciting and memorizing. As a woman approaches marrying age, she takes extended visits with nearby relatives to meet their neighbors as potential spouses. These visits are necessary because few potential spouses live within a day's walk of her own home. Women usually marry between the ages of 19 and 23. The agricultural season encouraged most of us to marry in late November or early December, which is after the time-consuming harvest and before the coldest part of the winter had set in. In the wedding ceremony, we didn't yet have the traditions of wearing white or of giving gifts, but the bride did wear some white items. If you asked them why they dress this way, they would answer, because it has always been done so. But the entire neighborhood would come to the house to celebrate with dancing and heavy drinking. Most everyone would spend the night by packing into the house and onto the beds. In the year 1800, about 30% of couples were already pregnant when they got married, but only half as many were in 1840. Bennett reports that today, 40% of first births are premarital. In the past, illegitimate births were not even recorded in the public birth records, as if the child was not a person. Abortions were sometimes used to end a pregnancy. If the child could not yet be felt moving, then the abortion was considered legal. In 1800, women continued to have children into their 40s. Since many adults died before our youngest child had left the house, fewer parents experienced an empty nest and grandparenting was less common. A year's supply of pig meat was slaughtered on a single day, packed into a salt box for 10 days, hung on rafters to be smoked for two days, and left to be eaten throughout the winter. Other foods were also hung to dry from the ceiling or rafters inside the home. Game meat included deer, possum, and raccoon. Notice that the domesticated pig has lost its camouflaging colors. Some wealthy families in the Mid-South filled a large pit with winter ice, which remains frozen long enough to be used in the summer. In her book, Gleanings from Long Ago, Ellen Mordecai says one person warned that ice in the summertime went against nature. Recall that the medieval Chinese used fast boats to move ice from north to south. Remember also that through the last 10,000 years of village life, clean water has been the hardest thing to obtain. Since apple trees were abundant in New England, apple cider was stored in barrels for the year and was alcoholic. We drank it at every meal. So did our children. Immigrants from Germany brought beer making knowledge. Beer is about as old as is civilization. Most of us have meat every day, while in Europe, commoners rarely ate meat. In New York City in 1841, residents bought $12 million in food. Of this, 39% was spent on meat. 25% on grain, 22% on dairy products, and 10% on vegetables. You might like to compare these percentages with your own. Half the meat was beef and one quarter was pork. In the U.S., bread was usually made from wheat. Only 1% of the native-born population had even heard of the cheaper oat bread that was common in Europe. For one million years, or maybe two or three, we gather hunters had been cooking over an open fire. A couple centuries ago, we moved the open fire into a hearth or fireplace within our home, but still cooked in the same manner.
In the year 1709, people found how to make coke from coal. Coke produces enough heat to reduce iron ore, and with the growing industrial revolution, huge quantities of low-cost iron are produced for the first time and used for many things. In 1813, the cast iron plow began to replace the metal-covered wooden plow. John Deere introduced a steel plow in 1837 that was strong enough to turn tough prairie sod. Cast iron cooking and heating stoves appeared around the year 1820 and changed our cooking technique for the first time in a million years. It took a few decades for the use of iron stoves to spread across the nation. When one family was the first in their town to purchase a cooking stove, the other town's people might warn that it would poison them all, but instead, within two years, most every family had stoves. One woman said that the first time she started a fire in her stove, it seemed like magic. Instead of turning meat on a stick placed over the fire, the iron cooking stove had top-side heating services placed at waist height. Heavy iron pots no longer had to be lifted into and out of the blazing hot flames of the fire. Since stoves used just one-third as much wood as did the open fireplace, less wood had to be chopped on the farm or purchased in the city. Cookbooks quickly appeared for this newfangled machine, just as they would 150 years later when microwave ovens first appeared. The preparation and cooking of foods has always been among humanity's most complex procedures. We humans first began full-time farming in ancient Mesopotamia about 10,000 years ago. Our subsequently invented cities required many new occupations, but usually 90% of us have been occupied as farmers. This was still a case for those of us in the United States in the year 1800, but increasingly less so with each successive decade. In the year 1800, 80% of us are full-time farmers, 95% are full or part-time farmers, 10% are self-employed artisans or shopkeepers, and another 10% of us are hired laborers. In the year 1900, only 40% are farmers and in the year 2000 only 1% are farmers. As we industrialized, the percentage of us living in urban areas would grow from 10% in the year 1800 to 40% in the year 1900. As has been the case for every farming family in the previous 10,000 years, our activities were tied to the local agricultural seasons of planting and harvesting. Weddings and births were clumped around those months of the year that allowed a break in agricultural activity. For 10,000 years, much of the daily conversation between farmers has involved the weather and crops and the health and multiplication of livestock. We spent many hours behind the plow. In 1837 in Connecticut, the farmer Horace Clark wrote in his diary, I have followed that plow for more miles than any man ever did or will ever do. For the last 10,000 years, or until the last century, everyone knew what the purpose of a plow was and what it looked like. Many of us big city residents today aren't too sure of its purpose. Each day was filled with hard physical exertion for all, but no one complained of the work because they had no idea there could be any other way. In the year 1800, a single person alone could not handle all the duties needed to make a home function. Mills are prepared from scratch, clothing is kept in repair, the house and farm need repair, crops and animals are tended, a few surplus items are made for sale, and socializing is done. Until the 20th century, all of these chores were done by hand, as it was a handmade world. How many hours per week does your family spend doing these things today? And what sort of things do you now do with your spare time? A child went to work young. Daniel Drake of Mazelik, Kentucky, described his childhood chores. At the age of eight, he rode on a horse to steady it while his father plowed. He planted seeds as his father covered them. He weeded. He stood guard over the crops by throwing rocks at squirrels and crows. 
he cared for stock, and he chopped and hauled wood. At eleven he was given an old gun to scare pests from the field. At twelve he held the plow and guided the horse himself. At thirteen he split rails and built fences. By sixteen he was doing a full man's work in the fields. Danielle's sister Lizzie, at the age of ten, was sent to a farm one mile away to watch over twins and their aged father for an entire week. She had complete charge of the house. She woke up at five o'clock in the morning, walked a distance to get water, made breakfast, and got the children ready for school. She then cleaned the dishes and began preparing dinner. We women worked in the farmyard milking the dairy cows and feeding the chickens and hogs. Skim milk and swill for the hogs would be poured into a trowel dug out of a big log in the Wampanoag fashion. We maintained the vegetable garden and spent many hours cooking at the fireplace. Every woman knew the preservation crafts of salting, pickling, and smoking. Bread was made in the home including wheat, rye, Indian, and John and cake. Inside the house we churned milk into butter by vigorously shaking it for about an hour and then kneading it with our hands or with wooden paddles. The Ward family made 80 pounds or 35 kilograms of butter per week. They did this using 80 pans and then bartered the results at the local general store. Not every household has the knowledge required to make cheese. First, rennet from the stomach lining of a calf is used to solidify milk in the curd. After that, a press is used to squeeze the whey from the curds. Then it is covered in wax and left to age. In effect, the calf's stomach acids have partially digested the milk and turned it into cheese that could be stored for long periods without spoiling. Tea from China had long been England's beverage, but in New England, coffee is more popular because it costs less, since it has grown in the New World. Coffee is obtained in bulk form and then ground and pounded. Sugar becomes more widely used as its price falls. It is bought in loaves that are wrapped in purple paper. The loaves have the shape of a tapered cone. Mrs. Child recommends that the purple paper be boiled in apple cider and alum to release the purple dye that can then be used on cloth. The doors of our homes had no locks, but both tea and sugar might be kept in locked boxes. Sugar scissors are used to cut off little pieces from the sugar cone. Outside the house were dark nights and starry skies. If your neighbor is not too far away, you can see their candle lights at night. Residents in the big city purchase candles from a candle maker in town. A large office of 10 persons typically used just eight candles and the personnel tried to work near the daylight windows. On the farm, one day each spring was spent making a year's supply of candles from animal fat and leftover cooking grease collected through the year. Candles were made before warm weather made the fat rancid. A candle is made by repeatedly dipping a wick into the molten fat. The finished candles are stored in a cool place away from the mice. A candle box, made at the local tin shop, kept a few candles close at hand to quickly replace one that burns away. Neighboring families might conduct so-called change work in which everyone meets at one home to help that family make candles and then meets the next day at another home to do that work. Earl explains that once per year, refuse grease and fireplace ash are also used to make laundry soap. This is a day-long sensitive procedure in which water is carefully mixed in to get lye and then soap. It is common to hear someone say, we had bad luck with our soap this year. Soap might be made through change work. The earliest drawings of a spinning wheel are from around the year 1250 in Baghdad and also in China. Medieval European spinning had been done by hand. In 1800 in New England, half the homes have a spinning wheel used to twist fibers into thread. 
We spend many hours spinning thread every day. Household mothers often delegate spinning to their daughters, hired help, or to an older, unmarried woman who lives in the house, hence the term old spinster. Thread and clothing are also made from flax plants, as seen in this painting from the 1400s. Flax was first used 10,000 years ago to make baskets. To make cloth, flax is picked in midsummer, allowed to partially rot in water, fragmented with a flax break, hatcheled by pulling the fibers through a series of spike tooth tools and then spun into thread on a small spinning wheel. Thread of wool might be dyed before being made into cloth and is then said to be dyed in the wool. Throughout civilization, various plants and animal parts were processed to make dye. For example, blue dye is obtained from indigo plants. Scarlet from the cochineal insect of South America and purple is made from South American logwood trees. And so this top dyeing is putting another color on top of it. So it's in the pot for anywhere from a half an hour, the yarn itself, in from a half an hour to an hour or more, depending on the day. Usually, thread was taken to town to trade for cloth, but some of us had looms to make our own cloth, which could also be traded in town. Many households exchanged goods or labor with a not-too-distant family that did have a loom.